Hi, it's Hank Garner, the host of the Author Stories Podcast. Today's episode is episode 50. We finally made it. I hope that these past... Uh, 50 episodes have been as entertaining, exciting, and educational for you as they have been for me. Each week, I say that I'm really excited to have that particular guest on, and it's true because I have grown so much as a writer, and I hope you have too, uh, by getting to be associated with these people that I've had on the show. Uh, And today is no different. I'm really excited to have Andy Weir on the show, author of a a huge breakout book called The Martian that is about to be a major motion picture starring Matt Damon. And to celebrate that, I am going to give away an audio book of The Martian. All you have to do is comment on the show notes at hankgarner.com on the on today's episode just go down to the comments at the bottom of the post and just leave me any comment about uh what you've liked about the author stories podcast it doesn't have to be much just a little sentence and if you will do that then i will put you in the drawing and a week from uh today on uh august 17th i'll do the drawing for an audiobook version of the martian Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. As always, go to HankGarner.com for all of the uh, archives of the show. The show is now also on YouTube. Uh, All uh, 50 episodes of the Author Stories podcast so far are on YouTube. You can search them on my channel. There's a link on the blog. And as always, if you want to help support the podcast there's a uh, an amazon link on the sidebar of the website if you would click that and then just go shop at amazon like you normally would we get a small commission thanks for listening well thanks for joining me again for the author stories podcast this is hank garner your host and uh, each week i bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers this week uh, is a very special episode because it's episode 50 of the Author Stories podcast, and uh, to celebrate this momentous occasion, I uh, asked a uh, a very special guest on, and, and uh, very happy to have Andy Weir on the podcast this week. Uh, Andy, of course, is the author of the blockbuster breakout hit, The Martian, uh, and if you don't know anything about that book, then you've been hiding under a rock. Uh, but we're going to uh, – a Martian rock, possibly, but we're going to delve into that. Welcome to the show, Andy. Hi. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, I ask all of my guests as we get started uh, to give us a little background about you and and tell us what it is that made you want to become a writer. Um, you know, I don't know. I think I've just always enjoyed the concept. I, uh, I've, I'm, I've been uh, – avid sci-fi fan since i was a kid i guess i guess i just always wanted to be a writer (laughs) i i hear that answer a lot uh there's that that is a a very common answer that that people say well i've just always been a writer it's just something that i've always done uh was there any specific uh time in your life that you look back on and you say you know what i at this point maybe it was a book that you read maybe it was an experience you had was there anything in particular that made you say you know what i i'm gonna write stories one day hmm well i'm trying to think i mean i was writing stupid little stories when i was like eight you know right (laughs) so i don't know i mean i guess one time when i read um i read robert heinlein's red planet in in just a day and it was a school day so i was like reading in the back of class and doing stuff like that and I got that that really inspired me to read a bunch. Like I, that's what started a jag of me just like reading all the time. But uh, I don't know if that's what inspired me to write. I guess I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I just can never remember a time when I wasn't full of stories. That That's great. Um, full of something I, anyway. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit about where the Martian came from. Uh, well, uh, let me back up. You have. Uh, if anyone has read The Martian, you you realize that this book is chock full of science, uh, and, and there's a you know a a, a derivative of the genre uh, called hard science fiction uh, that is you know more scientifically accurate than maybe just some some dreamy sci uh, sci fi, uh, but there's there's very very specific science in this book what what is your science background to begin with um i'm a computer programmer so no applied sciences or well i mean 
no, physical sciences. Um, yeah, computer programmer. All of my knowledge of space is just from a, a lifelong hobby of being interested in it and an enthusiast. Did you uh, – were you a, a computer geek uh, growing up? Um, yes and no. I mean right, right around the time I was a teenager is when I started to really take an interest in computers. And so um, so pro- probably around like 14 or 15 is when I started to really enjoy that. What was your first computer? Uh, a Commodore VIC-20. Nice. I, I was a TRS-80 man myself, uh, uh, but, but there's a lot of overlap in those. Radio uh, Shack's finest technology. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Oh, man. Uh, what, when did you write your first computer program? Oh, well, I mean, just saying like 10 print Andy, 20 go to 10. Right. Um, yeah, that'd probably be back in around fifth, fifth or sixth grade. Fifth grade, just on a Commodore PET. Or not a Commodore PET. It, uh, yeah, it was a Commodore PET. Yeah, I think so. Just that the school had. Um, first program I wrote for myself, I think I was, like, when I had my own computer, my, my style in VIC-20. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I think it was, uh, I was like 11 or 12. Was there something in particular that really grasped your interest and, and, and led you toward uh, programming and computer science in general? Um, I don't know. I just, uh, it, that was the era where, um, you know, arcade games were, uh, new. I mean, that was like, I was right. in the first generation of kids to grow up in arcade games. And I guess that, that got my attention. I played a lot of, uh, my Atari 2600 and, uh, stuff like that. And I guess I, I, I had an interest in how the inner workings went and I wanted to make my own, my own games. Gallagher, Galaga and Defender brought a lot of people over to the dark side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Spy Hunter was one of my favorites back in the day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so tell us about how, how The Martian came about. So you're you're working as a computer programmer. Is that right? Yeah, at that point, yeah. And and you had uh, – you'd been writing a blog? Um, well, not a blog. I had a, I had a website where I was putting my various fiction efforts. Like I, okay. I would write – either comics or uh, short stories or serials, and I was putting them all on my website. And The Martian was just one of the things. It was a serial that I posted chapter by chapter, about one chapter about one chapter every six to eight weeks. Okay. And what was your initial plans for The Martian? Was this just, just another story that you dreamed up and, and were just, just putting it out kind of piecemeal? Yep. That, that was pretty much it. I was just... I thought, oh, that sounds interesting, and then so I wrote it as a serial. I didn't really have the ending in mind. Well, I kind of had the ending in mind when I started, but not very clear in my mind. I just kind of started. <laughs> uh, did you um, – so how many people were, were reading this website at, at the time? Um, I had uh, – around the time I started The Martian, I had been writing for 10 years, and I'd – like on the website – and I'd accumulated, well, based on the size of my mailing list, I accumulated about uh, 3,000 regular readers. So I had 3,000 people reading it, and most of them are nerds like me because that's the sort of stuff I write. And um, so it was cool because they would tell me where I got scientific errors or something. They're like, oh, uh, hey, I'm a chemistry professor, and you should know that you got this chemistry wrong here and that sort of thing. It was great. Like I, I, I called them beta readers. Yeah. I think a lot of people would like to know how you built that community. Um, uh, yeah. I, I think a, a lot of people now uh, – and, and the web is very different now with social media. That's uh, you know, It's kind of pulled traffic away from personal websites and, and things like that. It's a, it's a different landscape. Uh, how did you go about building that 3,000-person that 3, audience when, when you didn't have a big product to hawk as it yeah. were? I just built them up slowly over time. Like I said, it took about 10 years. So it wasn't like I, I mean, it wasn't this in, you know, insanely popular site or anything. Uh, I started out with web comics. This wasn't any sort of deliberate agenda. This is just kind of the order of things right. that I did for no reason. Um, I started out with web comics. I actually had a much larger following when I was doing web comics. Um, but then I, I got sick of those and I went for straight up narrative fiction. And uh Yeah. I don't know exactly um, – well, one, th- one thing that helped was I, I wrote a short story called The Egg, and that got really popular online. 
and that brought a lot of people to the site and got me some a bunch of new regular readers all at once. So that was pretty cool. That was just a short story. It was uh, about a thousand words long. Nice. Uh, now, were you uh, active on any bulletin boards, things like that, that uh, kind of helped to build that community, or were these people that were just organically coming to you through search results or things like that? Yeah, organic. I, I didn't do anything to market my site or any of my stuff, really. Gotcha. Just got around by word of mouth. Right. So the the um the Martian has kind of become uh, one of these things of legend, where you know <laughs> you've got this the story that you just start putting out a chapter at a time, and and people start coming back and wanting more. Uh, at what point? And and I've heard you on some different interviews, uh, kind of give the story of how you. Uh, uh, you know, kind of reluctantly publish the story. Uh, but at, was the was the story completely finished uh, when you you know decided to uh, you know put it uh, on, on your website where people could download to their Kindle and then eventually upload to KDP, or was this still a work in progress? Kind of, what's that timeline like? Um, well, I was posting it uh, chapter by chapter until it was done. And so the whole book was complete before I made an EPUB or, a, you know, an, a, um, an e-reader version, uh, which I just posted to my site. And then the uh, then the readers, you know, a lot of them said, like, well, I, I love that there's an e-reader version, but I'm not very technically savvy. Can you just post it on Amazon, which is what caused me to post it to Amazon. And then I was really and, and Amazon forces you to charge at least a buck. And so I was really surprised that people, so many people bought it when they could just download it for free from my site. <laughs> so I, I guess it's because people are just willing to pay a buck to avoid technical hassles. And Amazon has a great reach into the readership market. Absolutely. And and you can't discount also uh, the willingness of people to uh, to support your work if, if you give them a way to. Yeah, that was another factor. Um, so for years and years... People, I, I would occasionally get email from people saying like, hey, I'd like to support you. Do you have a PayPal donation button or something? And I would always say, no, you know, I'm a computer programmer. I, you know, I make, I, I'm a Silicon Valley engineer, senior level. I, I, I make pretty good money. So I wouldn't feel right, you know, taking donations, right? Um, so I always said like, no, no, thanks. And if you really want to donate money, donate it to cancer research on my behalf, you know, or something like that. Right. But then... When I put the book up for sale, all my readers suddenly had an avenue by which they could give me money. <laughs> they were like, oh, well, I've already read the book, but I'm going to buy it from Amazon just so I can give Andy a buck. <laughs> nice. Yeah, uh, cool. yeah and uh, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me that the, the people that your stories connect with uh, and that uh, people will email me and, and, and tell me things – uh, that I never intended or didn't, you know, uh, consciously intend. And uh, it, it amazes me the way stories connect with people and then the way they want to give back due to that. It, it, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's nice. And, yeah, it's true. A lot of people, you know, draw conclusions from the Martian that are much deeper than anything I had in mind, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Where did the original idea come from? So – what year did you start writing The Martian? Uh, well, start like when I actually wrote Chapter 1, I started in 2009, but I'd had the idea in mind for several years earlier. Um, it's, it came about because I was sitting around imagining how could we do a manned Mars mission, not, not for the purposes of fiction, but actually just sitting around speculating on how a manned Mars mission would work. How do we get the astronauts to Mars? How do we get them back? How do we make sure they don't die while they're there? And I got to thinking about all the things that can go wrong, and any good mission plan accounts for failures and problems. So I say, like, okay, well, how do I make sure they don't die if there's a breach in their habitat? How do I make sure they don't die if a rover breaks down? How do I – and so on. And I, and then I started saying, like, okay, now what if these two things go wrong? What if these three things all go wrong at the same time? How do they make sure to survive there? And the kind of increasingly desperate scenarios and things they'd have to do to survive, I, I started to think, well, that's – that this – this might make a good story. So I created an unfortunate protagonist and subjected him to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any connections uh, with NASA, uh, people that, that, were, uh, that you could 
bounce questions off of to to see if you were you know in the right ballpark, or is this completely uh, your imagination? Um, it just uh, well, lots and lots of research. So I didn't know anybody in aerospace at the time that I wrote The Martian. Uh, I do now. <laughs> I'll bet. I know lots of people now. It's awesome. Uh, but at the time I wrote it, I did not know anything, a- anybody. Uh, but I'd had a lifetime of being a space enthusiast, so I had more than a layman's knowledge. I'm not an expert by any means, but I'm an enthusiast, right? It's my passion, so I know more than a typical person does. Right. And then um, just beyond that, tons and tons of research. I was like, okay, I want to find out how this works. Look it up. <laughs> I want to find out how that works. Look it up. But of course... This is my hobby. This is like, you know, the space program and stuff like that. You know, researching that and learning about it is something I really enjoy. You know, they say write what you know or write, 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 write what you love. And so, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't like this um, big, uh, I don't know, how do I put it? It wasn't this drudgery, you know what I mean? It, right. it was fun. I, I actually, a lot of times I enjoyed doing the research a lot more than the actual writing. Because, you know, writing is hard. A writer will do anything other than write. (laughs) You're absolutely right. It's like, i got to get some writing done today, right after I clean the garage, (laughs) because anything's better than writing, right? And so doing the research was fun, and I'd get way down into the ultra nitty-gritty, and, you know, eventually I'm like, well, now that I'm looking up the exact, you know, operating system that ran on Pathfinder... And what the boot, what the boot sequence text would have looked like, I think I maybe have gone a bit far. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it plays a, a role in the book eventually. That's, I mean, you, you uh, know, yes, you, yes, you're, you're able to use those things. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, um, there are uh, there there are bits of science in the book. Uh, did you make a? Uh, passing reference to or uh you know the the main protagonist mark watney will uh, kind of as he's mulling things over he just kind of spits these details out uh that i get the impression uh, there's a lot more research and a lot more uh factoring and uh, thought that went into this one sentence oh, yeah. uh how much of that uh you know is there and and the the other side of that is how, as an author, when you're uh, getting down into the weeds like that, <laughs> how, how much of that uh, do you include, and and how do you develop that instinct uh, that tells you, you know what, let, let me just make a passing reference to this instead of writing three pages on why this <laughs> science works. How yeah. do you develop that that instinct? Well, that was the biggest challenge, actually, in writing the book, was there was a bunch of exposition I needed the reader to know. Right. But at the same time, I didn't want to drone on and on and bore them. Um, so that that was a, just a constant balancing act for me. And sometimes, you know, when I reread the book now, sometimes I see like, ah, I went a little too heavy on the science there. That could be trimmed up. And other times I'm like, ah, I was a little too brief on that. I think that maybe lost a lot of readers. Um, but... Yeah, the the one thing, I, I guess, in terms of developing the instinct on what to say and what not to say, you have to kind of, I don't know, pretend you're someone else, you know, you make believe, you say like, okay, I'm a reader, no, I'm not Andy anymore, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person who doesn't necessarily know this, and then you kind of like, read it from that mindset and say like, okay, what, what would I get stuck on here, what would I not understand, and at what point am I, does it get repetitive? And I say, like, okay, I understand this now. You didn't need to give me that much detail. I, I guess it all comes down to um, being able to hypothetically put yourself in, in the reader's shoes, right? And it was hard, though. The hardest thing wasn't so much, you know, figuring it out. The hardest thing was saying, like, oh, you know, it took me a long time to work this out. It should take you a long time to read it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. There's, there's a huge investment here. Yeah, it's like... There, there are places where it's it, exactly like you said. There are places where there's just a one-off sentence that, uh, you know, turns out it took me a week of research and math to to figure that out, right? So, like for instance, when he casually says, like, "Oh, it took 124 days to get from Earth to Mars," you know, in the beginning, right. uh, at the beginning of the book, he says, "Like, yeah, we got we got from Earth to Mars in 124 days." Well, that that was a month of orbital dynamics calculations and writing my own software to calculate a constantly accelerating craft 
moving throughout the solar system from a from a specified launch window, <laughs> and it was just like a huge amount of work. Wow. Uh, now the uh, now the, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, the the book is set in the unspecified future. Right. Uh, it, do you know when the book is set? Yes, I do, and now it's uh, public because other people have worked it out. Um, <sighs> just. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no other uh, like a, a reader, uh, Kenny Ray, his name is Kenny Ray. Um, he worked out um, the exact launch date uh, and, and the exact date of like Sol 6 or whatever. He worked out all the dates based on communication latencies and orbital intercept times and stuff like that. So from from information given in the book, he was able to back calculate the date. Because, of course, I had real dates uh, because I had to pick a launch window. And the right. launch window is defined by where Earth and Mars are in their orbits and that, you know. So, yeah, if you're curious, um, they landed on Mars. So Sol 1 of the book is, I think, November 7th, 2035. Ah, so now the, the secret is out. The secret that, is out, yes. That's a hardcore actually, fan. Yeah, it's really cool. And uh, they're actually um, – it was going to come out anyway because the movie people are like well, – when they're making the film, they're like, yeah, when does this take place? We need to know for the marketing equipment and for the marketing push. Right. And so, you know <laughs> – and so if you look at things, you'll see that like um, – if you look at the marketing materials, you'll see it says like, oh, Mark Watney was born on – you know, in 1994. <laughs> and you can kind of work out you know, from the ages of the characters and stuff. Wow. Yeah. So the the book uh, you write it kind of serially and post it to the website. Then you finish it. People uh, start asking for a uh, a better way to read it. So uh, you post it as an EPUB. Then it, eventually that goes to Amazon. Uh, at what point on Amazon does this thing kind of take on a life of its own? Well, I posted it to Amazon in September of 2012. And by December, it was really it, it had gotten into the top sellers lists. So late September, so October, November, December, about three months. And Christmas helped a lot with the sales. Um, and I didn't even realize that it was selling well until it started showing up on the top sellers lists, because you know I I I would just get these you know I'd just look at the daily reports and it's like okay well you sold 300 copies today, and I would think is that good. Is that I, I don't I don't have any notion of what to compare that to. Right. But in the uh, KDP uh, system, when, when you join your automatic, I mean, your username is automatically you can access this forum of authors and just people are there talking about authory things like, oh, hey, how do you market your book? And, oh, hey, what, you know, that just talking about, you know, all, you know, being part of an author community, that sort of stuff. And uh, one every now and then there'd be a thread where people would say like, "Hey, post your sales numbers," you know, because people would didn't mind talking about that stuff, and people would be posting numbers like, "I sold five copies every day last week. I'm thrilled," and you know, "I sold ten, yay!" And I'm like, "I'm selling 300 a day. I guess I'm doing. I guess this is abnormal then." <laughs> now, did you post in there uh, those numbers, I, or, or were you just oh, sitting back going, "Oh my god, I, I was just lurking," and I was like, "Huh." <laughs> That that is so awesome because uh, I think in this day and age, especially authors starting out, there's there's such a wealth of information, uh, you know, about KDP and um, self publishing and this whole kind of thing. And I think people come in with an expectation that you know this is going to be hard work and and I'm going to have to build an audience and um, well, you know. True. <laughs> you know, one or two for the first month and then it kind of scales up. You know, there's uh, but. You kind of came in from the opposite direction, uh, and that's such a great story uh, because you, you absolutely had no baggage coming into it. Well, yeah, and I I I built up my audience in another way, and I mm -hmm. think that by the way, having that audience to start off with was, I you know I kind of bungled into what turned out to be a good snowballing formula. I think because I had I had my my regular readers of 3000 people. And then when I posted to Amazon, like all 3000 of them immediately went and bought the book. Right. So right. it has this spike of sales very quickly. And that makes Amazon say, Oh, okay, well this is selling well. We're going to put this in the, you might also like lists for other books. 
Right. You know, and then it starts to work its way into the kind of Amazon's internal suggestion system. And of course, um, my readers all posted reviews of it. And, and so it got, you know, a nice, nice review. So it shows up kind of high in the list of how, you know, how many stars books have. And so I think, uh, I, that, you know, it was absolutely unintentional, but it was a big deal that I started with this large kernel of instant sales and uh, reviews for the book that made it, you know, that that brought it to the attention of more readers. Right. So, yeah, you did have the perfect storm of uh, of of sales, reviews uh, and a built in audience that comes in. And uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, I, I heard Hugh Howey say one time that uh, when he was early in his writing career uh, that he uh, he figured that he wanted to get several books out to begin with because he knew it would take a while to build his audience and he would rather uh, his have his tenth book break out than his first uh, but that's based on uh, I have no audience and it's going to take a while to build one you, you came in with an audience well uh, yeah, and, and bear in mind, like, The Martian was my third book. <laughs> it was just the first one that didn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that's such a great point, uh, because I, I think a lot of people look at a breakout book, and, and they look at, at someone as being an overnight success, and, and right. we've all heard people talk about, you know, being a an overnight success 10 years in the making. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much the case with me, except for it, it took me even longer. My first book I wrote in when I was in college, so that would be I was in my early twenties. The Martian, I I you know went out when I was um uh what uh forty one, forty two, so about twenty years between those two events. <laughs> but it wasn't nonstop writing the whole time, right? Uh, and and this was something that was just a hobby of yours, just something that that brought you enjoyment. Uh huh. It and uh. So The Martian was something that, that you, in fact, did write with no expectation that it was ever going to uh, to be anything other than enjoyment for you and for, well, more than a handful of people. But, you know, you had a, a community of people that, that this was geared for. Uh, uh-huh. how, how important do you think that is uh, to uh, to write? for the enjoyment of it instead of looking at this as one more business opportunity? Uh, well, it was, it's always, so I never even considered it a, a, a business prospect until I actually had, you know, a print deal in hand up until then it was, it, it had always been, well, that's not entirely true up until then it had mostly been just a hobby, right? Um, the, the slightly longer version of that story is back when I was in, Shortly, back in the late 1990s, I got laid off from AOL, and I got a really good severance package, and so I had a bunch of money, and I could go, I realized I could go years without having to work and 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 maintain my current level of expenditure, and I'd be comfortable. And so I thought, okay, here's my chance. I'm going to take a shot at being a, full, a professional writer. I'm going to write a book, and then I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to actually dedicate full time, write a book get an agent, try to get a publisher, that sort of thing. So I wrote a book. That, that was my second book. I wrote, I wrote it. It was called Theft of Pride. And I tried to get an agent, and I couldn't. And I couldn't get a publisher interested. And, you know, kind of the standard tale of woe that every author has. Collecting right? rejection slips. Yep, exactly. Rejection slips from uh, literary agents. No one was interested. And the, the book was okay. It wasn't good. Uh, the wordsmithing is poor. You know what I mean? Uh, the yeah. plot... The plot was reasonably good, I still think, but the um, the the writing itself was bad. If it was going to be a viable book, I'd I'd have to rewrite it from scratch. But anyway, after three years uh, of you know just rejections, I decided, all right, well, I gave it a whirl. Um, it didn't work, uh, but I, I now, now I don't have to wonder what might have been, right? And so I, I gave it a shot. Didn't work. Back to the computer industry, which wasn't like some big failure for me. I I really enjoyed programming computers i still do i it's it's it was like later on in life when i left my uh, programming job to go full-time on the writing after the martian success it was not a take this job and shove it situation it was like i'm gonna miss my coworkers. i like my boss i like my team you know right anyway uh so 
that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Basically, you said, how seriously did I take it as a career as opposed to just a hobby? Well, for a three-year stint earlier in life, I took it very seriously as a career and failed, and then I decided, okay, from now on, it'll just be a hobby. Now, now that's a uh, a really uh, intriguing thing that, that I don't get to ask a lot of people because uh, very few people have – uh, been in the situation where you were, uh, I think a lot of people look at writing and uh, and the uh, telling stories that, you know what, I would love to do this full time. And if I could ever build up, uh, you know, to the place where I could do that, I would love to just do this full time. And then they have these dreams of, you know, I could write five novels a year if all I had to do was sit and write. Uh, so you had all the time in the world to do this. Uh, how hard was it still to sit down and write? Still very hard. Well, I have all the time <laughs> in the world to do it right now. That's my whole job right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and it's still a challenge. Um, it's hard to keep focused. It's, um, uh, you know, and, and it's a it's a big change from my previous lifestyle, which was, you know, engineering. And, you know, as an engineer, I had very, very objective goals. It's right. like... Okay, here are the features we need you to implement. Here's the due date. We're going to have the product launch on this date. We need QA to deal with this. You have a list of known bugs. You need to fix them. And you're part of a team. You know, you, you've got a lot of people to work with and interact with. And you have a boss checking up on you every day, right? Writing right. is exactly the opposite in every way. First off, there's no objective results. It's just, hey, write a book and try to make it not suck. And then... Uh, no boss, no one breathing down your neck. It'll be a due date, you know, something like 11 months in the future. Uh, no team. <laughs> you're, you're on your own and no one's forcing you to work other than you. <laughs> right. It's, it's an adjustment. It's a big adjustment. I'm, I'm slowly adjusting. And also I have the added complication. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining, but the added complication of, um, uh, since the book is spiked in popularity with the movie coming, I, ha I have a lot of interviews to do. I have a lot of uh, media stuff, a lot of uh, oh, what do you call it? marketing, movie marketing related things to do, and that that eats up a lot of my time. I, I can imagine. Uh, at what point did uh, did the big publishers uh, start taking notice and and come to you with a with a print deal? Uh, Random House uh, took, uh, let's see, the, the print deal was agreed to verbally with Random House in March of 2013. So that would be, you know, I, I posted it to Kindle in September, and then Random House was knocking on the door around March, so about six months after I posted it. Wow. And that was uh, the same time Fox came for the film rights, and that was uh, the, sa the same time as the... Um, the print deal was going on. The the movie deal was being negotiated, and so <laughs> those two deals were agreed to four days apart. Good so that grief. that was that was an eventful week. I'll bet. Uh, what was that feeling like that uh, you go from, you know, within uh, I guess probably within a year's time when you started writing it to uh, to publishing it and it starts getting this audience. Uh, that you never planned on, and now Ridley Scott wants to make a movie. What? Yeah, it's, it's how do you process that? It's you know you don't. <laughs> it's like you know everybody when you're writing you have fantasies like this you know daydreams right of, oh yeah it's got but you, you never imagine it'll actually happen and then when everything comes together and it actually happens you're like what? <laughs> it still hasn't really settled in like it's still like. A large irrational part of my brain doesn't really believe that movie exists yet. <laughs> right. I haven't seen it yet. I'll get to watch it uh, later this month. Oh, that's so exciting. For that listeners, much. for for you listeners listening after the fact, this month is August at the time that we're recording this. <laughs> right. Uh, and I've seen the trailers. The trailer looks stunning. Looks oh yeah, amazing. Uh, and uh, there's also some. Uh, some other videos that they've been releasing on YouTube. Uh, yep, the viral, is, viral uh, videos. Is it? Yeah. Oh my God! I watched the one today where uh, Watney and the other astronauts are are uh, debriefing, decompressing yep. after the ten day stint. Oh, it's awesome. Oh man, Matt Damon. He totally nailed the character. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely and, nailed. 
at – And what I was going to ask you is that I listened to the audio book. I, I told you earlier that uh, I, f- I listened to it about a month ago. Uh, I read the, the Kindle edition several months ago, listened to the audio about a month ago, and – Man, Matt Damon's performance is spot on Absolutely. with the audiobook performance. Uh, how did the audiobook come about? It, what part of the timeline did you decide to do an audio version? Actually, the audio version came before the print version. So okay. I, I was approached by Podium Publishing, who are the um, the company that does the audiobook. And um, yeah, they did a really good job with it. They got a great narrator. His name is R.C. Bray, or Bob Bray is what everyone calls him, but his professional name is R.C. Bray. And um, he just did a fantastic job on the narration. Oh, he knocked it out of the park. Oh, yeah. He got an award for it, actually. I, I, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. it was, it's absolutely uh, incredible. Um, so so the audio book, you, you produced that. Did did that start picking up some steam as well? Did, uh, oh, yeah. The audio book, I mean, I didn't really take it seriously. You know, it was like, oh, okay, whatever. You're going to make an audio book. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Man, the royalties from that have been like – well, <laughs> I've been really surprised at how at how well that's been selling. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Um, so the uh, you get the uh, the print rights that deal done and the the movie deal done at the same time. Uh, how does that start changing for you when when uh, when Random House got the book? Did they pull the self-published version off the market? Yes. Uh, uh, actually, uh, even even earlier, um, Podium also asked me to pull the self-published version. Uh, really? Down. Yeah. Or no, no. They they didn't. They wanted me to pull down the free version. So okay. initially, at the time I made the uh, the audiobook deal, which was the first deal that we made, um, the uh, uh, the self-published version was still up on my website. I still had the deal was yeah you can buy it on Amazon or you can or you can get it for free from my site. And so the audiobook guys are like, okay the 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 version you're selling on Amazon is fine, but we want you to take down the free <laughs> version because <laughs> we kind of feel that might cut into our sale. Yeah, you're killing us, Smalls. Yeah, you're killing yeah. me, Smalls. And then. Um, <laughs> And Sandlot, good movie. Um, but then uh, when that was a way back reference for for those of you out there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then um, uh, when Random House got the rights to the book, and they started working on it, they had me remove the audiobook. Uh, sorry, no, they had me remove the the Kindle edition as well. So then for a while, for several months there, the only um, legal way anybody could have get the book was to buy the audiobook. Ah, and then and then the the print edition and the uh, Random House owned um, ebook version came out and et cetera. Did the the audio book uh, kind of have a similar trajectory with uh, it picking up steam and kind of finding a, a, a new audience all its own there on Audible? Uh, I think it, it was it sold really well just right from the start. So it didn't really need to pick up steam by the time. By the time they, you know, created the audiobook and got it out there and up on Audible, uh, The Martian was already, um, you know, a top seller on Amazon uh, for the ebook version. So they, they, they got the benefit of that, and it was pretty sweet for them. And, and for me, you know, I get <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, had, were you able to have any input uh, to the, uh, the film? Do you get to play a role in that at all? Uh, my my only job on the film was to cash the check. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a very important job. It's a good though. job. Yeah. yeah. But, so they didn't have to include me in anything, but they chose to. They they chose to involve me in a lot of things, and that was pretty cool, uh, especially the screenplay. So Drew Goddard, uh, veteran screenplay writer, uh, wrote the screenplay. And he included me a lot. We talked on the phone back and forth. I mean, we'd talk on the phone almost every day when he was in the thick of it. And then he sent me uh, versions of the screenplay to get my feedback. Um, he made some changes based on what I said. He ignored other things I said. You know, it's his screenplay. Yeah, right. uh, I think it came out really well. I think it's going to be great. And, uh, yeah, so it was kind of cool to be involved in the process, right? Yeah. They invited me to go to Budapest, which is where they did the studio work. They invited okay. me to go there, but I'm not a really great with flying, and I just can't see myself. I couldn't see myself getting out to Budapest, so I declined. 
Which is interesting for a guy who writes a book about going to Mars. No, it's ironic. Yeah. I uh, ironic, but I write about uh, I write about brave people. I'm not I, one of them. <laughs> I I totally get it. I do. Uh, I do love to hear though that that you got to have the level of input that you did on the screenplay because uh, I think that everyone dreams of their book becoming a movie, uh, but in the back of all of our minds, there's this hesitation that I'm going to have to give my baby <clears throat> to someone else, and they're going to. It's no longer going to be mine. It's going to be theirs. Then, uh, were, were you scared at all? Did you were you nervous about what they were going to do to your book? You know, it's weird. I never was because uh, probably for a few reasons. First off, I was, you know, I got to see the screenplay come together and I could see that it was a, a really good, a really faithful adaptation of the book. And so I was yeah. really pleased with that. And then um, second off, I think because I'm used to working on a team, my whole career has been as a software engineer. So there's always been and. and you know, in software engineering, you do a lot of design work. You say like, okay, how are we going to put the um, how are we going to put the code base together? What are the big chunks? Uh, how how will this system work? How will that system work? You know, and you make compromises with the other engineers. It's like, oh well, I think this design would be best, and another engineer is like, no, 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 I think this one would be best, and you guys compromise and work out something that you're both happy with. So I'm used to that sort of team dynamic for creating stuff, right? So right. I guess I was already comfortable with it. I didn't feel, you know, unusually possessive of of the story. I felt like, okay, well now it's going to go into this mill and be modified as needed to make it popular for a, you know, for a visual medium that's like different than a print medium, right? Right. Right. Well, that that's great. I I love to hear that. Um I I think this uh, you know, writers can be very uh uh kind of uh, loner uh, <laughs> yeah. type, you know, that it's got to, I'm doing this all by myself and it's my way or, or no way. Uh, and I, I love that mentality of, you know, that, that this is a team effort and to, to get this story out to the, uh, to the world at large, it, that's a, a great way to, uh, to approach it. Huh. Cool. Um, the, one thing that, that I loved about the book is that, uh, there is a, the Martian reminded me of what I loved about science fiction when I was a kid. Uh, that you know, it seemed like in the in the golden age of sci-fi, if you will, uh, that science fiction was very hopeful, and it it challenged us. It, you know, it challenged the the scientists and engineers of the day to to kind of push our horizons to do bigger and better things. And even though the you know the the gist of of the story is, you know, Mark Watney is in dire trouble. Uh, it's a very hopeful story to me. Uh, I took that away that this is uh, a story of the human spirit that cannot be uh, held back and, and that we will always find a way to do bigger and better things. Uh, and a lot of science fiction now is, uh, you know, dystopia is, is very big. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of science fiction now is like cautionary tales of, yep. of, you know, doom, we are doom. we yeah, we are the worst thing. And this is what happens when we, you know, just are left to our own devices. Um, but I, you know, I was I was talking to my son uh, who uh, while I was reading it and just thinking, you know, this is what good science fiction is, is it it challenges us to to keep pushing forward to to bigger and better things. Uh is is that a conscious thing with you, or am I just projecting my own uh, <laughs> stuff onto this? Uh, you um, know, do not, you have any feelings about that? Not quite. Uh, so it wasn't. Uh, I didn't have any sort of moral or goal. Uh, I when I anything I write has no point other than to entertain, right? So I'm not trying to change yeah. people's mind on anything. I'm not preaching anything. I'm not trying to you know make a point. Uh, I just want when somebody reads a story of mine, when they're done, I want them to think, huh, that was cool. And that's it. Um, but uh, it does reflect kind of a lot of my own personal, like my own kind of viewpoint on the world. I guess I'm more optimistic than is the norm right now. I, uh, I really do have a high opinion of humanity. I think we're a very cool group of folks and uh, we always do great things. Just ask yourself. Pick any two centuries in history and ask yourself which one you would rather live in between those two. You'll always pick the later one. Um, right. It's always going to be better. 
you'd rather live in the 21st century than the 20th. You'd rather live in the 18th than the 17th. It's just, it's, we always make the world a better place consistently. And there are little, we drop the ball here and there for 10 or 20 years at a time, but then we continue making it better. And I guess, um, I guess I just have that view of humanity that while there are a lot of jerks out there and, you know, people who cause real harm, they're greatly outnumbered by the people who, uh, who help. And so, I mean, like on 9-11, 19 people made that happen and thousands of people rushed in to help. Right. I, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, – and good stories bring that out, that, that humanity is, is not a lost cause. Um, I don't think it ever what... was. I think there's just a, a cynicism sells. And it's, um, it's also – if you take a very cynical view, it's really easy to come up with conflict, Right. And conflict mm-hmm. is the root of all stories. So you, if you say like, oh, dystopian future, well, then everything gets really, really easy. You say like, okay, I have one morally strong character in a corrupt and horrible world. Then immediately, you know, the reader's on my side. The, uh, and everybody feels a little ganged up on by the world once in a while so they can project in and so on. Right. But it's just, I don't know, it's overdone. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and the... The problem with it becoming overdone is that the the, the literary types that are, should be so kind of counterculture become trite and overused, and the the stories of hope and and of humanity succeeding become <laughs> the counterculture again. It's right. it's kind of weird, but um, yeah, I I agree with you. I would I would much rather look at. Uh, at, at what we've done right, and and it's a fantastic time to be alive. I mean, we saw freaking photos of Pluto last week, you know? Right. Um, well, also, it's just this, what we think of as a current trend of doom and gloom. I mean, I remember, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was the same thing. All the stories sure. of the future is like, oh, this takes place in the dark and miserable year of 2010. And, <laughs> right. like, you know, at this time, all the oil has been consumed and people, you know, fight in the streets for bread. And it's always just doom and gloom. But you know what? 2010 was way cooler to live in than 1985 because, like, in 2010, I had Internet. <laughs> Yeah, high speed internet. <laughs> high speed internet. Yeah, and the Russians had not taken over my local high school. Yeah, Russians had not taken over your local high school. That's right. although Red Dawn <laughs> took place in the year it was made. So, uh, true. Yeah, true. Yes. Was that eighty four? I'm not 85? sure what your mid eighties. Mid eighties. Yeah, that was a that was an awesome time to be a kid. You were scared of everything. Yeah. No. But, yeah. Every <laughs> every night I go to bed wondering if I was going to get nuked. <laughs> no. The day after, boy, that kept me up all night. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, uh, Andy, what's what's next for you? Are you working on a new novel? Yeah, I am. I'm working on my next book now. It's tentatively titled Zhek, Z H E K, and um, it's a more traditional sci-fi. Uh, it's got aliens and faster than light travel and stuff like that, but done my own way. I came up with one little kernel of of bull. <laughs> of made up <laughs> physics and i said okay here's the fake physics and then everything stems from that and the fake physics isn't in conflict with real physics you see what i'm saying right this is some additional right. physics people to people in you know the real world don't know about <laughs> gotcha uh do you since you have access to more uh you said that you know lots of people in the uh you know admission uh control and the, and the uh the flight center uh do you, does that affect your writing from now on oh yeah uh, absolutely anytime i need information on that stuff i've got tons of contacts that i can talk to <laughs> i've got i've got a side project that i'm that is more uh more hard science fiction um see the book i'm working on that i just told you about i actually have a contract for that so that's my primary uh you know thing that i'm working on but i've got a side project which uh kind of under wraps a bit but uh is much more like hard sci-fi and uh you know space program stuff and so it's great to have all these uh mission controllers and astronauts to email and say hey i got a question awesome uh the side project is is that something that you're uh gonna publish yourself or is this uh that you're gonna give to the publisher or have you even thought that far ahead uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it'll be, it'll be a professional thing. It wouldn't be like, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, 
self-publish. Uh, it, you know, how do I put it? Self-publishing is something I did because I didn't have any other option. I'm not. I I, I love the idea of having a publisher <laughs> because gotcha. they're they're experts on publicity and marketing, and I'm not. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, Andy, where can people find you on the web to follow up with what's going on and uh, just kind of plug into your, your process? Uh, Facebook is a good place, so you can find me there. I have a verified account. And um, uh, there's the website andyweirauthor.com. Okay. And any idea when the next book is going to come out? Probably middle of 2016. Okay. All right. And the movie, uh, The Martian, comes out when? October 2nd. October 2nd. We'll look forward to it. Uh, Andy Weir, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. 